sort of has a characteristic color. Okay? And they're showing these colors very faint here to sort of illustrate that you know, if the brain does send some top-down signal, it's probably a fairly weak signal. It's certainly, if your brain sent the exact same signal down when you're just thinking, imagining a color, as when you actually see a real color, that would be very problematic because then you'd be hallucinating all the time. <laughs> right? You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Did I really see something yellow or did I just think I saw something yellow? You need to know, you need to be able to tell that difference. This is actually a very interesting problem that all of these sort of top-down theories have to deal with, and they deal with it in different ways. But, um, you know, to the brain needs to somehow be able to tell the difference between real stuff out there and stuff they just predicted. Okay. So, so, so this is a very crucial question. Not only do you think, oh, they're expecting some color or other, but can you actually figure out which color they're expecting? So that's what they tried to do in this study. So your question really gets to the heart of it. Okay? So what they said was, can we decode, um, can we decode uh, what color they were looking at, what color they were imagining when they were just seeing black and white pictures, but sort of recalling, aha, I'm seeing a black and white picture right now of, an, of a banana, but I know from my previous experience that bananas are yellow. Now I'm seeing a strawberry, I know strawberries are red. Okay. Can you actually get not just activation in color sensitive areas, but different patterns of activation, such that you can actually tell the difference between just looking at some uh, color sensitive uh, part of cortex, can you actually tell the difference between you know, even though everything that's just hitting their eyeballs is black and white, can you tell the difference between when, they, when they're looking at something that normally would be colored yellow, normally would be colored red, normally would be colored green? So, um, and, and what they actually found was that yes, you can, okay? which is sort of nice. Uh, so, uh, although it's a very surprising thing, I, I have to check that, that um, they, they must discuss this, I'll have to check this. But you would think, okay, given your question, you would, <clears throat> you would think that you would actually be able to decode this more successfully from a classical color area such as V4 than from an area such as V1. Although V1 does respond to color too. I mean, there's these areas called cytochrome oxidase blobs which are responsive to color. That's what Margaret Livingston discovered. Um, so it turns out that you, so there's two points here. One is that yes, you can decode, even though it's just black and white stuff is hitting their retinas, you can actually decode which color they're sort of thinking of or remembering or whatever, predicting, whatever you want to call it. Okay? Um, and you can actually do it uh, best above chance actually in V1, even better than you, better than you can actually do in V4. So, so somehow, some, you know, when I look at a yellow, when I look at a black and white picture of banana, some sort of yellow information bearing neural signals actually can be read out from my V1 which are different from the signals if I'm looking at a black and white picture of something that's typically red, like a strawberry, or you know something that's typically orange, like a carrot, or something like that. Okay? Um, and as a nice comparison, they said, well, what about when you're showing people the real colors, and then you can decode from all of these areas. Okay? So, um, so and notice that this is much stronger. There's a lot more stuff going on here. So, so your kind of mental image of something is like a sort of weaker version of uh, a weaker version of what the actual stimulus would be. Maybe that's how the brain tells them apart. Although even that would not be a sufficient explanation because if I just kind of catch a little glimpse of a banana, right, or a banana in a, a dim room, okay, I still need to tell the difference between actually seeing a banana in a dim room versus just imagining a banana. Does that, does that sort of make sense? So, so this is some nice illustration that some, some, uh, some top-down information, uh, or what's almost certainly top-down information, because the knowledge that bananas are yellow, well, maybe it's encoded in V1, but that seems unlikely. It's certainly not encoded in your retina. Your retina doesn't even know you're looking at banana, right? Um, so something from some higher level area that's actually recognized that this is a banana that I'm looking at, even though it's black and white, seems to be sending information to some more basic primary sensory area actually saying, aha, this thing is actually going to be yellow. Um, and uh, though, if any of you are actually, I know one or two of you are interested in philosophy, if you read this book, Consciousness Explained by Daniel Dennett, he talks a lot about, I mean, which was written, you know, in like 91, uh, he talks a lot about this kind of thing. Um, and um, 
actually sort of comes out uh, more in favor of the hypothesis that there's really no need to, um, to you know, kind of sort of color in your V1 in yellow, right? Well, I mean, why bother, right? I mean, which is actually a very interesting question. Now, I, no one knows the answer to this, I think, it's fair to say, right? If, if I'm looking at a black and white picture of a banana, and, um, and I'm like, aha, well, I happen to know bananas are yellow, I could, I, you know, all my, my brain's done its work now. It can just take some sort of high-level abstract checkbox and say, yep, yellow. You know, why bother sending down these signals to V1 and sort of, you know, activating yellow stuff down there? Now, maybe it's because the brain, you know, maybe that's just the brain, the way brain, maybe that's just the way the brain encodes stuff. But the brain's not really giving itself any new information, right? The brain already knows that bananas are yellow. It doesn't sort of know that even more after it's sort of gone and, 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 and colored in V1 in yellow, right? But it does, so despite the fact that in some ways that seems like a informationally pointless thing to do, it actually does it. So there may be some very interesting reason why it does it, and no one really knows the answer to that. Is yeah, it, right. they, and, and, you know, I, I haven't read the paper, but is it like maybe a reverse hierarchy idea? That's Where? well. There's there's different there's a here, so like many other aspects in cognitive neuroscience there's there's, there's the result and then there's a question yeah. of how do you explain the result right. and um, and I would say this is very open for debate so right. you know these particular authors are very are suggesting that this is an evidence for predictive coding that the brain is actually you know I would say that it's definitely evidence that the brain is sending top down signals or it's probably evidence that the brain is sending top down signals. You, Ideally, you'd want to see the source as well as the endpoint, right, of the signal. Right. Um, but as to exactly why the brain is sending top-down signals and what kind of information processing, computational role those signals are playing, that's open. Um, you know, and uh, and so that that you know, if it, but I think what this what this experiment is really nice for showing is that. These are the kind of questions that you can actually start to poke at with fMRI. So this is really getting at questions of internal processing and representation and all the kinds of things which it's very easy for fMRI not to deal with, right? You know, just seeing which area lights up isn't going to touch those questions at all. But these guys are doing a much more interesting question. They're saying, you know, they're pushing those questions. Now, they may not get definitive answers out. They certainly, you know, the fMRI certainly here is suggesting that there's some information about color even in V1, even when someone's looking at a black and white picture. But this experiment in itself is almost certainly not enough to answer this extremely interesting question that you raise of, well, what might explain that? Why might that be happening? And, uh, but I think it does suggest that this very interesting question is something which is within the remit that fMRI might actually be able to have a, go, have a crack at. Which, you know, if you're just kind of doing a well lit up type of experiment, you might think, well, they can't even touch that. Okay. So that's that's kind of what I like to do. Okay. So there's a whole uh, so let's so that's uh, you know, we didn't discuss that enough. So let's kind of wrap up that for a bit and let's look at what was actually related to the readings for this week, which is um, adaptation fMRI. And that's inspired basically by the same sort of motivation. In fact, I would say that pretty much everything in this course is inspired by that same motivation. And not just in this course, you know, in this whole area of work that many people work on. Um, but they're really trying to, to kind of, you know, go beyond just saying, well, you know, does some stimulus light up some area or not? And one of the real, uh, sorry, there's a typo here. I should say average. Uh, one of the real reasons why that's, um, why that runs into problems is because, you know, I might have two different, so you know your question about color, right? I might have, I might be looking at, at red and my color sensitive area might light up. I might be looking at green and my color sensitive area light up, might light up. So I might just thereby assume, aha, this color sensitive area doesn't even know the difference between red and green because it's lighting up for both of them. But that doesn't follow at all because it might be lighting up with different patterns. Okay? Well, even without looking at the patterns, you can actually pull these apart. So, um, so do, well, this is an illustration. This is an illustration of like uh, of why um, kind of standard fMRI tends to not be able to do that because you might have these different patterns. This is from an earlier study class. You might have these two different patterns, and then by the time you sort of spatially smooth them with the Gaussian, they end up looking the same. Okay, so this might be, you know. Uh, the pattern that means I'm looking at something red right now. This might be the pattern that means I'm looking at something green right now. And by the time it's moved in, you know, it's just like I'm looking at color right now. Okay, 
but the brain, you know, the brain doesn't have to look at its smooth activation, right? Well, the brain acts at a much, much finer scale even than this. So this is one of the reasons why smoothing is a problem. And this is one of the reasons why people are interested in looking at fine scale activation patterns and kind of pattern differences. But, um, but adaptation fMRI, driven by the same sort of you know, lack of satisfaction with this problem, it, it takes a different approach, which I think is an interesting approach. And the, the key idea is that, oh, here's some examples of some, uh, some different uh, studies that uh, look at that. So the key, the key idea is that neurons get tired, right? We get tired. Everyone gets tired, okay? Many of you might be tired right now. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, we were talking about how neurons have a preferred stimulus, right? Like, so that receptive field that we showed before, um, you know, it, it happened to like horizontal gray bars and it didn't happen to like vertical, uh, vertical black bars. Well, how can we exploit that? Okay. Well, suppose you take the pre preferred stimulus of a neuron and you play it again and again and again and again and again, okay? Then, or even just a few times, okay? Well, the first time is the neuron sees it, it's like, aha, that's my favorite stimulus, fire, 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 fire. Okay. The second time is like, that's my favorite stimulus, five, five, five. And the third time is like, yeah, that's my favorite stimulus again, but I'm kind of tired now. Okay. So you get this habituation in response. Habituation is just kind of scientific jargon for getting tired. Okay. The activation goes down. Um, but here's the crucial bit. Okay. If now uh, something different comes along, okay. so suppose you have, uh, well, I'm going to show you a specific example. If something different comes along, then that you're not tiring out that neuron anymore because other neurons that have that different thing as their preferred stimulus, they can start responding to it. Okay, so here's, here's a sort of illustration to it that hopefully will be uh, um, intuitive. Okay, this I made this slide quite a long time ago, so uh, that's why it has a uh, bush and print. Okay, so, and this, this approach was really invented by, uh, well, in neurophysiology, people have known this for a long time, but in fMRI, uh, this approach was pioneered by Callum McGill Spectre and Rafi Mala. So suppose I've got a bunch of neurons in a voxel, and these voxels just like politicians. Okay. Then you show them to a bush, and they're like, yeah, it's a politician. I'm going to respond. You show it to Bill Clinton, and it's like, yeah, it's a politician. I'm going to respond again. Um, but you might have a different voxel. Okay, so the key point is that this voxel is going to respond to both these stimuli reasonably strongly. You might have a different voxel that has a mixture of different things inside it. Okay, and in fact, pretty much all voxels are going to have mixtures of different things inside it. Because remember, there's literally millions and millions of different neurons inside a voxel. Okay, so suppose you have a voxel that some of the neurons inside it respond to democratic politicians. I mean, this is a made-up example. It almost certainly do not exist. So, you know, but, but, but this is to illustrate. And some of them respond to Republican um, politicians. Okay? Well, if you show this voxel these two pictures, then the voxel as a whole is going to respond to, to Bush because the Republican neurons are going to fire. The voxel as a whole is going to respond to Clinton because Democratic neurons are going to fire. So if you're just looking at the overall voxel activation, both of these voxels are going to look incredibly the same. Okay. Just, which is very much like uh, the problem that you get with smoothing. Um, but in this case, smoothing, not smoothing isn't going to help because these are all things within a single voxel. It's as high res as you're going to get. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so what can you do? Um, oh, why is that? Okay. So, uh, okay, this is why I just said that they all respond. The voxel responds to all of these. Both voxels respond <coughs> to both stimuli and they look indistinguishable. Um, my PowerPoint is misbehaving a bit. Okay, what happens if you present them, instead of individually, you present them back to back, okay? Array sequentially in time. Okay, here's where the, the neurons getting tired uh, becomes, becomes crucial. So recall, if you just present them sequentially, if you just present them um, separately, this voxel, we know, we know by design that these voxels have got very different things inside them. Okay. This one just cares, just responds to any old politician. This one has his intermingled populations that respond selectively to Democrats and Republicans. But um, in terms of just measuring, we're sitting outside the voxel, just measuring its hemodynamic responses, it just looks the same every time. Okay. So how are we going to see something that's different? Well, if you play things back to back, sorry, uh, if you play things back to back, what happens? 
So look at, let's look at that politician sensitive neurons. They say, you show them Bush. They're like, aha, it's a politician. They respond a lot. Okay? And then you show them Clinton. They're like, aha, it's a politician, but we're getting kind of tired now. Okay? So they respond a little bit less that time. But it's the same neurons responding, and that's why they're tired, because they're responding again. Right? So that the total amount of activation that you get is you know, quite a lot, but not as much as it could be, because you've got reduced activation the second time, because they got tired. They habituate to them. Um, now, let's have a look at this other voxel, which, remember, looked exactly the same when we were just presenting everything separately. Okay, now you present, uh, and this voxel, unbeknownst to us, has tuned but intermingled populations. So you say, so you show this one, and now instead of saying it's a politician, a specific subset of the neurons in that voxel say, oh, it's a Republican, and they, they fire. Okay? And then a different, and then you show Clinton, and a different set of, this is crucial, a different set of neurons within the same voxel, so from an MRI point of view, you can't tell that they're different. Right? But because of this repetition, now you can tell that they're different. Right? Even though spatially they're, they're in the same place from MRI's point of view. Now, now so you show, you show the Republican, the Republican neurons fire, and then you show the Democrat. Now this different but fresh set of neurons respond to Clinton. Okay? So they're, they're not tired because they didn't respond to this guy. So they, act, they fire more. So now we actually have different responses from these two sequences, from these two neurons. So this is, this is the idea of adaptation in MRI. And um, does this make sense? And um, there's a very, if any of you work with EEG or MEG, there's a very, very similar logic behind this thing called the mismatch negativity. Have any of you guys heard of the mismatch negativity? It has, when you do encounter, or MMN is often abbreviated, when you do encounter, it has exactly the same logic, exactly the same logic. It turns out there's another thing that has exactly the same logic, which I'll show in a minute. So anyway, so you can ask, you can use this to ask not just what makes a voxel, what makes part of the brain light up, but what counts as the same or different for a particular part of the brain. Yeah. And remember that you know, when a brain's activated, it doesn't tell you why it's activating. Okay, but, but by this kind of design, you can very specifically force it to uh, differentially activate depending upon some, whether something counts as the same or different, because if things count as the same, they're going to make the neurons tired. Um, there's a bunch of caveats about this, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. So one example of things counting as the same or different is categorical perception. So you can have a smooth continuum, uh, of, in this case, uh, Different um, different phonemes going from uh, bar to da. This is a study that I did, and um, uh, if you have a, a constant acoustic change, the way that people actually respond behaviorally is they don't just kind of continually say they don't say yeah this sounds like bar this sounds like da and it gradually gets more darish. There's this sort of jump, this kind of steep S-shaped curve rather than a straight line. Where they're like, yeah, it sounds like bar, it sounds like bar, it sounds like bar, oh, it sounds like da. There's a sort of sudden change. That's the essence of categorical perception. Um, and a, a corollary of that is if you have pairs which are different from by a small amount, say they're always like three steps apart in this continuum, when those pairs fall on opposite sides of the category boundary, then that sounds really different to, um, to a person. Whereas if they're on the same side of the boundary, even though acoustically the difference is the same, they sound quite similar. Actually, I have an example of that. Let's see if this will play. Okay. I'm just going to play this from the speakers on my laptop, so you may or may not hear this. So both of these pairs of sounds, in a, a pure acoustic terms, the difference is exactly the same. Um, this was I, this was uh, categorical perception uh, in speech was discovered in the 50s, but this is just an illustration of it. Okay. So here's uh, here's two stimuli. Well, you tell me if they sound the same or different. Da da. Because these are kind of crummy speakers, you may not be able to tell. Did they sound the same or different? Da, da. Okay. <laughs> okay. If these were playing from good speakers, they'd sound different. Yeah, they did sound kind of the same, didn't they? <laughs> if you were playing, let me try it not play it as loud so it's not like clipping out. Hang on. Da, da. Ah, uh, yeah, it's not working. Really. Okay, forget it. Never try and do a, a fine grained acoustic demo of a like, crummy laptop speakers played at the end of the room. Okay, so um, anyway, so, that, so the idea is that you can, um, you can see uh, 
that uh, you can see whether things are the same or different. So if you've got stimuli that, uh, that count as different, then if they sort of straddle this boundary, then that's going to then the difference between these two stimuli paired together and the individual parts presented on their own will be bigger than if the brain is treating them as the same. So that was my that was the idea between, between the, behind the study that I did a while ago. Okay. Now it turns out this has this in, interesting parallel with infant studies, um, and this is very relevant to work that gets done in this department because people like Dick Asen do do a lot of this kind of work. So remember how we had this example of. Um, the particular brain area might look at two different stimuli, say red and green, and it you know, might be a color sensitive area. It's like, yeah, I'm active for red, yeah, I'm active for green. And you might falsely um, infer from that that this brain area can't even tell the difference between red and green because it's responding equally to both. Well, a very, very similar thing happens with not just brain areas, but with people. Or, and in fact, people do this kind of study in babies a lot. So suppose one thing that people do with babies is they look at looking time. This was this Turk Brown uh, reading that, that I gave. Um, so, uh, so suppose you show a baby a picture of his mother, and it looks you know, for quite a long time before looking away. Say it looks for five seconds. And then you show a picture of his father, and it looks, say, for five seconds before looking away. Right? You might therefore conclude, aha, uh -huh, I guess this baby can't tell the difference between his mother and his father, because it looked for exactly the same amount of time with each of them. Now, obviously, that would be a false, uh, or at least an unwarranted uh, inference. Um, but the question is, well, then, how would you actually figure out that the baby can tell the difference between his mother and his father? If just showing mother produces this much looking time, and if showing the father produces this much looking time, what are you going to do if it produces the same amount of looking time? And the answer is exactly the same as this uh, fMRI, by, F, has exactly the same logic as this uh, fMRI adaptation habituation idea. So people do these studies uh, with, uh, with infants and habituation. This, can you see this picture? It's a little bit thin lines. This is from a, a nice review from Mark Johnson from quite a long time ago in Nature Reviews Neuroscience. So just as with, um, just as with adaptation fMRI, the key question is what counts as the same or different to a piece of a brain area in infant habituation studies, the key question is, what counts as the same or different to a baby? Okay. And just measuring looking time isn't going to do it, but if you have repeated presentations, and then you see, does this thing, and then you have something that's either the same, in which case the baby's like, oh yeah, I'm tired of looking at this, I'm still not going to look anymore, or something that's different, the baby's like, oh, what's this? Now something's changed. Okay, then you can see whether the baby continues to habituate or releases from habituation, and it has exactly the same logic. So here's an example of a couple of types of studies that people did. This is, these are both from some uh, key early studies by from Liz Belke's group. Uh, so one is, um, you know, you show a stick waving around behind an occluder. Well, we look at this and we just, without even thinking, say, yeah, that's a stick behind the occluder. But we're not seeing the stick. We're just seeing the top bit and the bottom bit. But because we, you know, are kind of good at perceiving the world, we're just like, oh, there must be a continuous thing behind this green bar. Okay. Now, babies may or may not know that. So, uh, at, a, at a given age. So, if you if 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 you show someone this stick waving behind the cluder, and then you show just a stick waving around, to somebody who understands or so a baby that understands that these are basically the same thing, this won't be very interesting. Okay. But, uh, but to, a bit, to somebody who doesn't really, hasn't really figured out that there's some continuation behind the occluder and just sees, yeah, there's this kind of thing on the bottom here and there's this thing on the top here and they're sort of waving around together, you could show them this and they'll be like, oh yeah, there's, there's, there's that thing on the top and thing on the bottom again. Yeah, I've seen those before. Now you might imagine if you if you saw a stick waving behind a cluder and then suddenly you saw this, you'd be like, "Whoa! I didn't expect that. All right? I was expecting this." Okay. So this. So if you had this repeated trial, this thing, this thing, this thing, then this thing, you'd be like, "Oh, that's really surprising." And you might look for longer. And that's exactly what babies do. Okay. Um, whereas if you have this thing, this thing, this thing, and then this thing, you'd be like, "Ah, that's not really that interesting. They just took away the occluder." You wouldn't look for longer. Uh, especially not if you're a baby, and, um, and so you would have continued habituation. 
So this is a very so this is and so you know this is a very powerful way potentially. Although it's, it's all controversial because it's cognitive neuroscience, it's cognitive sciences. People debate it's still debating exactly how to interpret this, but most people agree that this is a reasonable measure of whether the baby is actually you know counting these things as the same or different. You have to do all kinds of controls to be very careful that you're really measuring what you think you're measuring. Um, but I, what's interesting is it has exactly the same logic as adaptation fMRI. Uh, and here's another illustration. This is one that uh, the, the Nick Turk Brown paper uh, shows. Um, so you've got some kind of, you know, to, to what degree the babies understand that objects are still there as kind of real solid things even when you can't see them. It's called object permanence. Uh, when they're very young, they don't have it. They develop it, I think, uh, around around like six to nine months, is that right? Someone who studies this thing should know. Okay, so, um, so suppose you see the solid box and this sort of flat thing. Um, and the flat sort of lifts up and then stops, right? Notice that you're looking at it from this side, so you can't see this red block anymore. You just see the flat stopping. Okay? Well, you're like, okay, well, I kind of figured that the flat were gonna stop because even though I can't, even though I can't see this red block anymore, I still know it's there. Uh, very young babies, if something's not, they can't see it, it might as well not exist. Okay? Um, there's a different, a different scenario in which, you know, when the baby's not looking, the experiment takes away this block. And so now when the baby doesn't see the block anymore, actually the block really isn't there, which doesn't tend to happen much in real life. Things don't tend to disappear just suddenly. So you have this impossible event that the flap sort of goes, or let's say very unlikely event, the flop, flap goes up, 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 and then it keeps it, it goes to where the point where you sort of imagined that the, the, the solid, lasting, enduring, but hidden object was, and it keeps on going. So suddenly this object is not only not happening to hit your eyeballs right now, but it's just gone. Okay. So a baby who understands that things are still there, even when you can't see them, that has object permanence, would find this a surprising thing. And so, so here's, a, uh, here's a figure from the the Turk Brown paper. So here's the example. You show someone, you know, you show the baby the flap just going up and down a bunch of times. And then uh, if you show them just again the flap just kind of going and stopping, they're like, yeah, that's not very interesting. I'm not going to look anymore. But if you show them the, uh, the flap, these dotted lines are sort of meant to illustrate the motion of the flap. Okay? You show them the flap going da 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 and keeping on going even through where the block used to be, then the baby's like, oh, what? And then it looks longer. Okay. So if you look at, uh, if you remember those, um, uh, uh, the idea of something counting as the same or different, producing greater activation, here's something that counts as the same or different and producing greater looking time. So it's kind of interesting that it has exactly the same logic. Um, and here's, a, here's an illustration from fMRI. It's actually a, uh, from a, um, originally from a paper by Zoe Kurtz and Nancy Kanmisher. Came out in science section, um, but this is sort of Nick Turk Brown throwing it, saying, again asking what counts as the same or different for a particular area. In this case, is sort of like mid-level brain uh, vision area called lateral occipital complex. And um, and the question is, uh, suppose I see, suppose I see some shape, uh, you know, behind some occluders. This is actually very, very much related in spirit to. Uh, to this study, where you see the um, uh, you see the uh, by by Kelman and where you see this the stick behind the Buddha. Okay, you kind of it's called amodal completion. You you sort of you, there's a sense in which your visual system sort of fills in. You see, it goes back also to that idea of like filling in the kind of yellow in your lower visual visual cortex. There's a sense in which your visual system sort of says. Yeah, I don't actually see a stick right now, but I know there's a stick there at present. So I know that this thing is going on. Um, so, so suppose I have, uh, suppose I see this shape, this kind of you know blobby shaped thing behind some bars, and then I see either the same blobby shaped thing behind the bars again. So the exact same image hitting in my eyeballs. Or I see a quite different image hitting my eyeballs, but from a higher level point of view, it's actually the same blobby shaped thing. Now here's a blobby shaped thing behind the bars, here's a blob the same blobby shaped thing in front of the bars, yeah, it's still the same thing. Okay. So if you're the retina, 
or if you're V1, you don't know much about completing entire objects behind contours. You just know, you know, you have little tiny receptive fields. Actually, there is some completion that happens in V1, but let, let's imagine for a moment that V1 is mostly just looking at kind of little local patches of the visual world. Okay? In terms of little local patches of the visual world, this image is really quite different from this image, right? Because, you know, there's all these bars that were here that would be stimulating, you know, vertically sensitive, vertically tuned cells that are not getting stimulated anymore. And the fact that there's this sort of global contour that's the same, if you're just a little V1 neuron just looking at a little tiny patch of the world, you don't know anything about global contours. Okay? So, so the question is, if this, counts as the, if this counts as the same to a given brain area, then that tells you that this brain area is doing something quite high level. It's doing some sort of amodal completion. It's doing some sort of figuring out what the global shape is behind these occluders. Um, if, this, if these two images count as different, then the, the brain is doing uh, some, that to a particular brain area, then it's doing a much lower level thing. It's basically just looking at, you know, are there vertical lines, are there horizontal lines, stuff like that. Uh, and this is very, very similar to the idea, the, the categorical perception idea that you can have things that may be acoustically different, but may or may not count as perceptually different depending upon whether they're treated as a sort of high-level thing like two different speech sounds or as a low-level thing like just two different you know, acoustic waveforms. Okay. So, so here's, what, uh, here's what they found. Um, so they actually had a couple of other conditions as well. But um, the, 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 key, the key question that's being shown here is, does this count as the same or different to this particular brain area? So this... Uh, this, or, this yellow one, can you see the yellow one? It's, I guess it's reasonably good contrast. The yellow one here is the hemodynamic response of uh, this area, this kind of mid-level vision area, a lateral occipital complex, LOC, to when you literally show the exact same image twice, okay? this then this. And you don't have a particularly high response because this area has basically gotten tired. It's like, yep, it's a blobby looking thing behind bars, yep, it's another blobby looking thing, the same blobby looking thing behind the same bars, uh, I'm tired. Okay, so you don't have much response. When there's a big change that happens, okay, it's like, oh, now now I've got completely different sets of neurons that, are, you know, my my neurons that are tuned to this kind of blobby shaped thing are not responding anymore, but my different neurons that are tuned to this pointy thing they're responding now. Okay, so you get more activation. But the crucial condition is here, where you say. Um, Okay, I've got this blobby kind of thing behind the bars, and now I've got the same blobby kind of thing, but in front of the bars. Does this count as the same or different to this mid-level area? If it counts as the same, it's just going to keep on getting tired, and you'll have not that much activation. If it counts as different, then it won't. Then you'll have new, uh, fresh neurons getting activated. You'll have more activation, and um, uh, and you'll, get, uh, and you'll get a release from adaptation, so you'll have a higher overall stimulus. So what did they actually find? They, and that's this blue trace here, novel contour, meaning that the, uh, the lines are different, but the shape is the same. So it actually gets, it has very, very similar activation response to when you literally show the exact same retinal image twice. So in other words, as far as this medial, as this area, uh, lateral occipital complex is concerned, this and this are the same. They're as much the same as each other as this and this are. So this, so that tells you, not only lateral occipital complex is activated by you know shape and object processing. It's saying there's a very specific type of shape and object processing that we, a type of information processing that we know must be happening in lateral occipital complex because it must be doing whatever computation is required to figure out that this is the same shape as that, even though something very different is hitting my retina. Okay? And the fact that you get this repeated, repeated activation, uh, this habituation, is, is evidence for that. Yeah? So the difference is 0.05% fMRI signal change. Is this a typical significant difference? That's Amazingly, important? yeah. No, very good question. So yeah, so this gets up to about like, you know, 0.2, uh, and these numbers are small, I see. Gets up to about like 0.2%, 0.15%. Amazingly, this is actually, this actually would be a pretty decent difference. I mean, what this, this is just actually a summary graph from the Turk Brown paper, so it doesn't show the error bars. 
the original science paper does show the error bars, and it's very important that the error bars, you know, are like not bigger than this effect, right? So, so there's actually a real significant difference here. That this is a classic example, which happens a lot in fMRI, of something being a significant difference statistically, but a relatively small effect in terms of, you know, just percentage of, of signal. And in fact, almost all fMRI signals are like that. fMRI signal, fMRI is noisy, and you know, if you just eyeball, if you look at someone's fMRI scan and you just eyeball it, you cannot see fluctuations in the gray level. Okay, you, you know, because they're 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 very subtle. But when you when you subtract away the baseline and throw it into some stats, then you can actually see it, and it can actually be quite statistically robust. But it's not something, it's not something as big as you know, like recording from a particular individual cell, and you can hear it clicking a lot or clicking not very much. But you have, you know, you have in neurophysiology examples of, of fairly subtle contrast as well, where you know the cell might respond at you know 15 spikes a second versus 18 spikes a second, but which you probably couldn't tell just by sort of listening, but if, the, if those are you know, reliable differences, they'll come out as statistically significant. So, um, now, there's, uh, as you can imagine, the more stages an argument has in it, the more chances it has to break down. <coughs> so one of, the, one of the potential problems with this kind of line of work, and one of, this is one of the reasons why people tend to not do this as much anymore and tend to look more at sort of pattern-based analyses instead is because there are lots of things that can make an fMRI signal get tired, right? Remember that we're not actually measuring the neurons directly, we're measuring the neurons via this blood oxygenation level. So one common concern, I mean, there are ways of trying to deal with this, and people have looked into this, but it's still something to think about. Suppose you say, I don't think the neurons are getting tired. I think the neurons are just fine. I think your blood supply is getting tired, right? That might produce a very similar result. Now, people who don't study specifically trying to pull this apart, but that kind of gets difficult. Okay? So, so this is an instance of, um, of uh, you know, trying to do, I think both of, this, both of the things that I've shown today are examples of trying to ask sort of quite difficult questions and maybe not getting completely clean answers because maybe there might be an alternative explanation but at least you know it's asking an interesting question, putting forward a hypothesis, saying, "Well, this would predict this, this would predict that," and going and looking at the data. And there's no one, you know, there's no study that ever gets done by anyone which unequivocally has only one way of interpreting it. You know, I mean, I mean, certainly not when you're studying something as you know as, as murky and unknown as the brain. So, but it's worth bearing in mind that um, because we're not measuring directly neurons themselves, we're measuring neurons via the blood supply. What if the blood supply is getting tired? It's something to worry about. Um, it's something people have worried about and have thought about, but it's uh, it raises an extra level of complication. So uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just go back to Adam' question. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how sensitive uh, of like uh, fMRI adaptation. Like if you for psychophysics, is um, uh, adaptation is very sensitive. Mm -hmm. We just adapt, for example couple of milliseconds. Yeah. Or or you uh, or or you adapt to one direction. If just the test the stimuli to move a little bit another direction, right. then then the adaptation just a completely right. here. No, that's a very good question. Uh, and the answer is well, you know, it sort of depends how many times you present the stimuli and you know um, uh, you know whether the actual perceptual effect that you're probing is a very robust one. But the answer I think it's fair to say that the answer is the you know fMRI is noisy. I mean, visual psychophysics can be noisy too. So you can't. I hesitate to say it's for definite, but it's you could get very, very, very fine-grained adaptation effects with behavior, especially if you're willing to get someone to do enough trials. And you might need to get someone to do a lot of trials in fMRI to get anything that fine-grained. But people look at fairly fine-grained things. People look at, for instance, whether you know a particular brain area is tuned to different orientations of a face. You know, different facial expressions. So, if something produces a robust perceptual effect, like if something actually looks different or sounds different to a person, you should be able to find, usually, you can find some fMRI correlate of that. But, but it may be noisy. It will be noisy, and you may need to present a lot of trials. So, so there's not a single answer to how sensitive is this. But it's, um, but the types of things that impact upon it are kind of true. For any fMRI study or in any study, you know, you've got to have a kind of robust 
effect in the first place in terms of you know making people feel or experience or think something different and usually got to have quite a lot of trials usually uh, uh, but yeah this is definitely a noisy and tricky method but as is almost anything else so um, so anyway so uh, so next week we're going to talk uh, more about um, uh, semantic decoding, and I'll send out some email about that. But, uh, but if you're having any, if you're having any trouble with the, with uh, the kind of, you know, what question you're asking, how you're going to ask it, why should you care thing. First of all, do not worry because it's natural to have trouble on that. And second of all, please, you know, if you haven't already, you know, say to me, hey, you know, I'm, I'm having some difficulty thinking about this. Let's chat about it, and that's completely fine. That's my job to, to help you through that. So. Um, so anyway, so have a good uh, weekend at work, and uh, thank you. Oh, I want um, I'm going to see an astronaut tomorrow. Oh, so oh, I think I'll be ready. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's in that picture. Okay, copy the Yeah. I was actually going to go once. Oh, yeah? Do you have any, uh, do you have any, 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 do you have any